you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. The apostle said, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Father, I pray that you'd anoint the word as it goes forth. It will not return into you void. It will accomplish that which you please. In thy name we pray, amen. I suppose the church at Corinth was guilty, was more guilty of questioning the credentials, the authority of the Apostle Paul than any other church because time and again, he makes reference to the fact that they questioned him. Look at verse number 2. I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. That's as clear a statement as you will ever find in the Bible where they were accusing the Apostle Paul of not being led by the Spirit, but of walking according to the flesh, which therefore would reduce him to simply a, uh, a false, uh, a, at best, a, a zealot. Let's put it that way. And so uh, they, they questioned his authority. Now, one of the reasons they questioned his authority is because he went to the root of the matter and dealt with what they had, their problems. And they had some real problems, the church at Corinth. They had some heavy-duty problems. Some of them considered themselves to be super spiritual, said we are the disciples of Christ, some of Apollos and some of Cephas and so forth. Some of them said that they had super spiritual gifts and that the rest of the people in the church did not have the kind of gifts they had, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 14. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, some of them professed to have, uh, have no need, no real need of some of the other brethren in the church because they were, they were the head, so to speak, and they didn't need the hand or the leg or the feet or what have you. They didn't need each other, in other words. They were self-sufficient in themselves. And that is a sure mark of spiritual pride. Church at Corinth had a problem with a man with his own with his father's wife. And we're not sure exactly if that's a stepmother or his own mother. But in any event, he had his own father's wife. And, they, and yet, instead of being grieved over it and rebuking him and dealing with him severely for such a thing as that, well, they puffed up over it. In other words, they, they looked at that and considered themselves to be far more righteous than him because he was doing such a thing. And so the church at Corinth had some major problems and more than just what I've uh, enumerated to you tonight. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, the Apostle Paul says, we're warring a warfare. Now, you know, you never stop warring a warfare until peace is declared. You know, there's the issue over there in North Korea right now, folks. They never signed a peace agreement. All they ever had over there was a ceasefire. That's all. The 38th parallel is guarded to this day on one side, North Korea, and the other, on the other, the United States. And we've got an, we've got an insane uh, nut job up there running North Korea. Amen. And, uh, you know, somebody like him is liable to push a, push a button, pull a trigger, and, and start, uh, start some bad stuff. But in any event, a, 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 a ceasefire is not peace. It's not peace. Uh, so there never will be peace in this walk, in this Christian walk, in this world. There's not going to be any peace. You're not going to make peace with the devil. You're not going to come to an agreement with him where he says, all right, this is, the this is my territory. That's your territory. You don't cross this line. I don't cross it. We're okay. No, it's not going to work that way. No, no, no. He may, think, he may make you think you've made peace with him, but he is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. If you notice the real battleground in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 is casting down imaginations. That word imaginations literally means dreamings. It means reasonings. 
And I told you before how that the world, for the most part, lives in a dream world, a dream state. Their music reflects that. It's constantly dreaming, dreaming, never dealing with reality and the reality of life. And they don't because they can't deal with life. This is why they spend their time shot up on drugs or drunk or whatever. It's because they really can't deal with life. It'll harden them. An unsaved man, once he ever becomes, becomes really focused on life in this world, he is hardened. One of the reasons he's hardened is because of the hardness of life. And one of the reasons he's hardened is because of the inequities in life, the unfairness of life. And there's many other reasons, things that happen to him personally. And people get hardened in life. But a true, a true saint of God that's living for the Lord will not be hardened. They'll be, they'll be wise and they'll be softened. Their heart will be softened. They'll have room for more grace. They'll have room for more ministry. They'll know when to pour in the oil and wine. They know these things. They've been there. They've done that. The Apostle Paul says that we minister with the same ministry we've received, 2 Corinthians. We're able to give what we have. Paul said, what do you have, therefore, that you didn't receive of the Lord? We have nothing. We have nothing. Everything we have, we received it of God. One of the great, one of the great uh, points of wisdom in, in maturity and growth in Christ is to learn the place in this life where you're able to receive. You take a man that's puffed up in his pride and built his walls of ivory around him, you can't give that man anything. He's self-sufficient. And that's one of the worst sins there is. Did you know that? And self-sufficiency is not easily noticed, but a person who's self-sufficient really doesn't need the Lord. This is why God reduces us sometimes to ashes. As Watchman Nee says in his book, Sit, Walk, and Stand, once you're reduced to ashes, there's nothing left. Do you remember what uh, Brother uh, Gillum said to us the other day when he was in here preaching? He said something to the effect, God will take all your dignity away from you. Remember that? Remember that? That was wise because you can be put in a place where all your dignity is taken away from you. Your dignity is your self-support. It's your building up of self. We don't need self. We need him. Amen. And he said in the book of, uh, in, uh, in John chapter 15, he said, without me you can do nothing. He said, I am the vine and you're the branches. We don't find our way there. We don't, he, didn't, he doesn't tell us to find our place there. What he tells us to do is to simply acknowledge who he is in our lives. The Bible said, humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God that he may be able to exalt you in due time. The principle in scriptures, Philippians chapter number two, humble yourself and God will exalt you. He'll exalt you his way and his time. But self-sufficient people want to be exalted on their own and they want recognition for it. I was telling my wife on the way over here, there was one preacher in this country they put up on a big chair and they carried him around. And I don't know what the point was. I, maybe they were making some kind of a throne out of it, you know, what have you. If they'd tried to do that with me, I'd have said, <laughs> you get in it if you want to, not me. Well, he's dead now. He's dead. God took him from this earth. There are certain things that God won't tolerate. And let me tell you one thing he won't tolerate. God is no respecter of persons. When we begin to respect persons, to differentiate, to make a difference, to exalt men, to exalt people, you're turning the Holy Ghost, you're grieving him and grieving the, and, and quenching the Spirit of God. As an under shepherd, I watch for your souls, I'm accountable. According to the book of Hebrews chapter 13, I am accountable to God. God's going to hold me accountable one day for what's preached from this pulpit. That's right, and I have to, I know that. The Bible said, be not many masters, for you know we'll receive the greater condemnation. James said that. You've got to watch that stuff. You've got to be careful. If you're going to preach and teach to people, if you're going to be up in front of people, you've got to pay the price. You have to accept the responsibility. It's like the federal judges in this country who are stopping the president from, 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 uh, from, from stopping illegal aliens from coming in. I wonder if they understand that if they do slaughter a bunch of people in this country, it goes straight to their bench. They're accountable. They've got the blood on their hands. If you stop a man who's trying to save somebody's life, you're accountable then 
the monkey is on their back. There's an awful lot of people who would like to take the authority of a pastor, and they'd like to be in, they'd like to be up before people, but they won't accept the responsibility. And I've got that responsibility, and I don't take it lightly. I pray about what I preach. I pray about what I study. I got an awful lot of stuff that comes in, and more now than ever because so much is happening. Everything is accelerated. There's so much going on in the world today. I was just reading. I was just studying a document a few minutes ago. It's something like. Oh, I think 10 or 12 points that directly relate to the new world order and to this new spirituality that's coming on this earth. And I mean, every point, every one of them, good, outstanding points. And all of this stuff is just, it just, just exploding. And so what's a pastor supposed to do? You say, well, now, preacher, you get your, your pulpit is too political. I'm not up here preaching politics. I'm not going to preach Trump. I'm not going to preach Republican or Democrat. I've told you a thousand times, that's not your Savior. Amen. And he is liable to fall. And, 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 and a lot of people, I no doubt, would fall with him because they've got all their hope in him. My hope's in Christ. My hope's in the Lord. It's in the Lord. But if I have to make a choice between one who says he's against killing babies and one who is for killing babies, which side are you going to take? Stuff like that. And, but the problem is, you see, they want the church to be neutral. They want the church to be a place where, 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 where you get a good warmed over sermon on the mount every time you come. You're told how good you are. And you're told how to go out into the world and be good to everybody. And be goody, goody, goody. <laughs> and that's all it is. And you're never told. You're never told what you're sending your kids to school for. What they're getting in school. You're never told what kind of government is governing you. You're never told what these policies that are coming down upon you, what they're going to do to your life. You're never told that you have a responsibility as a Christian. The, the Lord Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees of his day, he says, you can discern the seasons. And what he said? He said, you can discern the seasons. In other words, you know what's coming year after year after year. He said, but you can't discern the spiritual things, the truths. So the line here in, first, in 2 Corinthians 10 is about the mind. The mind is the power base of your life. Now you're a body, soma, soul, suke, spirit, pneuma. A thing that is somosomatic or psychosomatic means that it is a soul-controlled reaction of the body. That's that kind of thing. That's what psychologists call it, psychosomatic. In other words, they can't find the presence of a disease in your body, but you certainly do have symptoms, see? So they say it's from the soul. The soul is suke in the New Testament. The body is soma, and then the spirit is pneuma. The Old Testament talks about the body a lot because the New Old Testament, they were attached to their body in a way we're not. Second, the book of Colossians chapter number 2 said that God hath circumcised us with a circumcision made without hands and putting off this body. And I've heard people make fun of the fact that I've said and others have said, that's literally, you're not tied to that body anymore like you were because the spirit now has been born again and the spirit is absolutely incompatible with the flesh. They're enemies of each other. They're enemies of each other. A born again believer in, in living in a body of death. The Bible said we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may not be of us but of Christ, right? Amen. It is a treasure in an earthen vessel. The outward man perishes, he says, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. The outward man is perishing, dying, but the inward man is renewed day by day. So this struggle, this struggle continues. It continues. The body, the flesh, has five simple senses, animal senses. That's all they are. The soul has intellect, emotion, and will. But the spirit has conscience, communion, and intuition. Now, this is what Watchman Nee says. And since he was a Chinaman and a Shemite, I listen to them when they start talking about spiritual things. For Japheth will dwell in the tents of Shem. If you'll remember, Abraham was a Shemite. Yes, sir. Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. God gave Shem a sense of spiritual understanding that a Gentile needs to pay attention to and learn from that. A lot of folks don't know that, folks, but what I just said to you, that's Scripture. So Watchman Nee, uh, you know, I don't know if you know who he was. He was a Chinaman that lived back in the early 1800s, 
and he was, a, he was a Christian, wrote a number of books. And I started reading his books right after I got saved. I hadn't been saved long until I, I, somebody introduced me to Watchman Nee. And I'm not up here today to completely endorse everything he says, but he's got a lot of good stuff. And he says that the spirit is conscious, consciousness, communion, and intuition. In other words, you commune with God not through the soul, but through the spirit, which only makes sense. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, he said, We look not at the things which are seen, flesh, but the things which are not seen, the spiritual world. For the things which are seen are temporal. Things which are not seen are eternal. We want communion with God. You can work your flesh up and have a nice fleshly meeting. And an awful lot of that goes on. And the flesh is all pumped up. And everybody's had a revival, quote unquote. But their spirit leaves like it came, just as dead as it can be. Therefore, they have no communion with God. They go back into their prayer closet. They may try a time or two. They may try to talk to God. Nothing flows. They may try to sense the presence of God. Nothing there. They try to talk to God from the heart and pour out their soul to God, pour out what's moving inside them to the Lord. But it gets boring. It gets boring because the communion is broken. If I could do anything tonight to help you, let me lay this foundation because this is so important for our walk with God. Whatever you have to do, get in that closet and open yourself up to God and start talking to him like you want him to hear what's really on your heart. And you'll be surprised if you'll start talking in simple talk to the Lord, you'll be amazed at how communion begins to develop between you and God. And you will begin to see his hand move in your life. That's the key to living for the Lord. It is that communion you get in prayer with God. And if you're not praying, you're playing. You've got to pray. There's no substitute for prayer. Prayer, proskuneo. The Greek word is proskuneo. It literally means to prostrate yourself, lay down before God, and give up everything you've got and cast yourself completely on him and there receive what God's got for you. The Bible said to humble yourself before the mighty, my, mighty hand of God. To humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. God is in control in our lives. God's the ruler. He's the Lord. Really, I, that's really, that's so, folks. It's so hard for people to get the idea that, that well, you know, I, God and I have got it worked out. God's my co-pilot. <laughs> I saw a thing the other day, and I thought that was pretty good. I'd never seen it put that way before. You see the, the, the bumper sticker said, God is my co-pilot. And this guy fired back and said, if God is your co-pilot, you're in the wrong seat. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. <laughs> I don't know if it means anything or not. The pilot sits in the left seat. And when you get in an aircraft, the pilot's in the left, the co-pilot's in the right. So <clears throat> the Lord ought to be over here. Amen. Amen. You're in the right, navigator in the back, if you're that big. My, I was the navigator, I was the co-pilot, and I was the pilot. Well, I was all of it. When I went up, in, when I was at 5,000 feet, there was nobody but me and God. And I remember the first time that my, drill, my, my flight instructor said, all right, son, today. They don't tell you beforehand. They don't tell you beforehand. You'll sweat yourself to death. You won't sleep the night before. But I went to get my flight instruction that day. We got in there. We went up, flew around, landed. He got out. He said, all right, this is it. I said, what's it? <laughs> he said, you're going to solo today. I said, ah, so. <laughs> okay. Now, if you don't think that's a big deal, you better know what you're doing. You're sitting, uh, you're sitting behind the yoke of an airplane. You're getting ready to take off. You're going to be up there at five, 6,000 feet, and you don't know what you're doing. You're not coming back. But you have to trust your flight instructor to know enough to, to turn you loose. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I taxied out, took off, and uh, it was quite a feeling. It really is. It's quite a feeling to be up there by yourself. You know, to be in an airplane at 5,000 feet and you're the only one in it, <laughs> that's quite a feeling. You better believe there's a lot of prayer meetings <laughs> in the sky. 
I have. Boy, I did. I mean, I've done some praying. I've done some praying uh, when I when I get up there. So uh, even if I even if I'm behind the yoke flying the thing, God's the pilot because He's the one's going to get me back. Amen. That's that's your that's your pilot. God's your pilot. Amen. You're the co-pilot. He'll let you go along for the ride. He's the one that determines the ride. Wouldn't you rather have life like that? Wouldn't you rather have the Lord be the one call the shots? I messed up everything I laid my hand to before I got saved in 1973. I messed it up. I'd like finally somewhere along the line get something worked out right, wouldn't you? Well, then turn it over to God. And you quit making the decision, let him make them. Do some praying about it. Do some praying about it. So the Bible says you're casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. You're constantly being bombarded with doubts, with, with, with things that tear down your faith in God, your trust in Christ. You're constantly being bombarded with, you know what the Bible says? Cast it down. Amen. Casting down imaginations and every high thing. Notice high thing. They always come across with this superior intellect, this elitist attitude. You poor little country bumpkin, if you only knew what I know, you wouldn't be out here praying to your God, your gods and your guns. You remember the, the, the patronizing, condescending elitists that just left the White House that talked about their gods and their guns? When he comes down to the end of his road, folks, he'll be worried about God just like all the rest of us do. And we all come down to that point. And I pray, I no ill against him, I pray he's ready to meet God but I'll tell you this right now, I don't want to go without him. I wouldn't walk out that back door without the Lord tonight. No, sir. I wouldn't go to bed tonight. wouldn't sleep. When I lay down in bed and pull the cover up over me and roll over in that bed, I know my heart could quit at any time. That could be it. Maybe I'd never wake up the next day. My wife turned over and there I'd be lying there stiff or cold next to her. You know, that'd be a horrible thing to happen. But it could. So what do I do? Do I go to bed at night and lay there and shake and quiver and sweat and worry about what's going to happen? No, I just pull the cover up over me and say, good night. I do. Good night. See you later, alligator. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. Do you know? How many of you know how long you're going to live? <laughs> Guy told me the other day when, he, when we bought this truck up there in Jefferson City, he said, he had said, a young man said to him, now, have you got insurance on it yet? He said, I'm not going to have any accidents. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. That's good to know. <laughs> I've had my share of them. How about you? You may not plan to have any accidents, but you sure could have one. That's life. That's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. So you're casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And what greater knowledge can you have than that? The knowledge of God. You, every one of you tonight have your own story about your own life and your own walk with God. You can go back through the decades, if you've known him that long, and you can see where God's hand has moved in your life and what he has done here, how he answered prayer there, how this door opened, how you didn't expect this to happen. But when you look back on it, you think, Lord was good, God was with me, and God blessed me. God will always keep you in a state where you don't know everything because he is still the one in control. He doesn't have to tell you everything. He doesn't have to satisfy your curiosity, but he will let you know he's the Lord God. And I can look back on my life, and there was 27 years of waste, 27 years of damnation, 27 years of rebellion, and then the lights came on. And the lights came on. And God's been good to me. It hadn't been easy. There's been times... It's been hard. I hadn't been saved any time. Now, I got saved in, in, uh, in uh, 1973. Wasn't saved any time until my wife came down with a giant cell tumor in her sacroiliac joint. Never heard of either one. And this, this physician comes back and he tells me that she's got a giant cell tumor in her sacroiliac joint. That's this joint where your legs come up and connect, okay? Giant cell tumor eating the bone. I said, Lord of mercy, man. What kind of tumor is that? He said, well, this is the good part. It's benign. This is the bad part. They're notorious for coming back. That was in 1973. But I'm going to do surgery. So he did surgery. And I went back to see her right after surgery. And when I went back, in the, back where she was in the bed, she was literally shaking and quivering and white as a sheet. She was hurting and suffering like I've never seen anything in my life. 
And I thought to myself, and I'd been saved. This is all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, this is how I awakened to God's hand on my soul. Because it was at that point that I began to really take a good hard look at what I was here for and what this life was about. Even though I'd been born again, even though I'd been saved, I got a real dose of reality right between the eyes. How many's ever had a dose of reality like that? I did. I did. I did. And it was after that when God started talking to me about preaching his word. He wanted me to preach. God wanted me to preach. And I fought him and said, I don't want to preach. He said, I want you to preach. I said, you got the wrong one. No, I don't. I want you to preach. I said, Lord, good night. You don't want you to listen. Look at all the good preachers in the country. You don't need me. I want you to preach. And so I had to fight with him and back and forth and back and forth. And finally, I yielded to it and walked down there in front of the church at, uh, at Basswood and told him, I'll preach. I'll do what God's called me to do. That wasn't an easy thing. I sweat blood. I know how these young men feel in here. I know exactly how they feel. Uh, some of them come up here and, 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 and I shake their hands, you know, when they get ready to preach. Ice cold. <laughs> you know what the old saying is? Cold hand, warm heart. Ice, I mean icy cold. And of course, the reason is because they're tense. They're tense. Well, listen, am I making fun of them? No, I'm a preacher. I've been there. I know all about that. I fully understand what that means because you're entering into a world that you really don't know much about at all and you're trusting on God. You're throwing yourself at God's mercy and you're saying, here I am, Lord, help me. It's not been an easy walk, but it's been a good walk. I could have never done with my life what God has done with my life. I can look back now. I'm 70 years old. Look back at the years. God has been good to me, folks. God's been good to me. He's been far better to me than I ever deserved. He's proven himself time and time and time again. He's a good God. And he answers prayer. And he'll take care of you. He may not do it the way you want it done. He may not do it when you want it done. But he'll do it his way. And his way is the better way. It's always the better way. It's always the better way. That's why you've got to humble yourself beneath the mighty hand of God. You've got to just say, all right, Lord, I'm not going to try to manipulate you by some spiritual manipulation, which you get a lot of preaching that's got that kind of stuff in it. I'm simply going to accept the fact that you're the Lord and you're God and you're going to be God when I go into this and you're going to be God when I come out of it. Amen. You're still the Lord. Amen. And that's not easy because a lot of stuff that's going to happen to you in this world won't make sense. It won't make sense. I feel for the guy that's got an answer for everything. I'm going to tell you why. He's worshiping his own brain. There's a lot of things in this world there is no answer to. And God meant it to be that way. Because the day will come when we'll know as we're known. So the Apostle Paul dealt with people who didn't trust him. He dealt with situations that came against him. He was stoned outside of Lystra. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten with rods. He was beaten. He had fallen He had fallen in the hands of false brethren. He had all these things happen to him. God said to Ananias in, in Damascus, when he saved Saul of Tarsus, he said, Ananias, he will suffer many things for my name's sake. God said right off the bat, I have chosen him to a ministry of suffering. Have you ever watched some Christians and you know they love the Lord and you know that they serve God and you wonder to yourself, why is it sometimes some Christians just seem like they have a harder lot than others? Did you know that I believe God's laid his hand on some of you in this house and you are intercessors? Everybody's not an intercessor. Everybody can pray an intercessory prayer. Yes, an intercessor is somebody who is a ministry called of God where they spend time in that closet and they literally take the burden of that individual into their soul and they represent them before God. And George Mueller was one of the intercessors that lived. He was aboard ship coming back to the States. He'd been over, he'd been over in Europe and for some kind of a ministry or something. And he was on board ship and they came into a, they came into a fog bank. And if you know anything, you know fog's bad news for a ship because they could, they could strike an iceberg. Anything could happen. 
and he was scheduled to be at a certain place at a certain time. And the captain of the ship said, he called, he called the ship to halt. He said, stop it. And, and George Mueller said to him, now, Captain, he said, i got to be at such a place at such a time. And if you stop the ship, I'm not going to make it. And all those people are going to be over there and they're going to be looking for me. And the captain said, I'm sorry, Mr. Mueller. And the captain was a Christian, but he wasn't really that dedicated. But he was a Christian. He said, Mr. Mueller, I'm sorry. He said, I can't do anything about this fog. And George Mueller said, I can. And he went down into the, he went down into the hold of the ship and he got on his knees and he started crying out to God. And he said, Lord, lift this fog and move it away so we can get to where we're going. And he came up out of that hole, and or the captain came down there. Captain came down to where Brother Mueller was. And Brother Mueller looked, turned around, looked at him, and said, Now, Captain, what do you say? Forward, what is it? Forward to uh, full, full, full speed forward. Time to go, Captain. The fog's gone. Captain said, what do you mean gone? It was there when I came down, came down into the hold of the ship. Go back up there, Captain. Captain went back up to the top of that, went on the top deck, and the fog was gone. <laughs> George Mueller prayed it away. Say, I don't believe that. That's too bad for you. I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. I do. I do. I believe it. And that's just one of many things that you could call back in history and see where God answered prayer. He, and the fog was gone. They got to where they were headed. And he got there on time, was able to uh, minister to the people that he was, he was intending to minister to. He was certain that God was going to do what he was going to do. You see, he was in the hold of the ship. There's no way he'd know that fog was gone. But he said, it's gone, Captain. So he could have been made to look like a fool. But he went up on board, and it was gone. Now, remember, George Mueller's the one who had those had the orphanages in Bristol, England. And he's the one who sat down at the table and had all those orphans and they didn't have a bite to eat. And he had them all gathered around the table and he bowed his head and said, Lord, we thank you for the food we're about to eat, for the feast that we're about to, about to partake. You promised in your word you were going to take care of these kids. You promised me that you're going to take care of them if I'd come in here and I'd represent them and I'd intercede for them. And Lord, I know they're hungry. So Lord, we're going to thank you for the food we're about to eat, not a bite on the table. Got through praying, knock on the door. Guy stopped outside and said, I got this truckload of food and I can't take it to where it's headed. Something's happened. Would you like to have it, Brother Mueller? That happened, folks. That happened. <laughs> that happened. He prayed the food in. He sure did. Now, after saying all of that, would you want George Mueller praying for you or against you? <laughs> I'd want him praying for me, wouldn't you? That's an intercessor. That's an intercessor. George, as far as God was concerned, George Mueller represented those kids. That's an intercessor. And you can do that for sick people, lost people, people afflicted with all kinds of problems and maladies of this life. You can become an intercessor. And you don't even have to leave your house. You can be homebound and still be an intercessor and get a hold of God. We're not all called to that. We're not all called. We're all called to pray. But thank God for the intercessors. And a lot of times you have them and you don't know who they are. You'll have them in your church house. You'll have them in here. And they're not going to be up in front of people. You, pro you probably hardly ever hear them say anything. But they're in their closets. And they're carrying you to the Lord. And they're interceding on your behalf. You know what that ought to tell you to do? That will tell you to be nice to people. <laughs> Because the one you're being nice to today may be the very one that's keeping you alive. <laughs> that's your intercessor that's carrying you before the Lord. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Battles in the mind. The mind can either be spiritual or carnal. You can have a fleshly mind or you can have a spiritual mind. And your choice, it's your choice. You can't make your mind spiritual. You can't do that. You can't make yourself spiritual. You can't do that. You cannot generate faith. You cannot generate anything spiritual. That comes from the Lord. But you can receive it. This brother stood up, stood up back there a few moments ago and he said, I just felt so much. I've just felt so much glory and joy coming into my heart. And he's talking like that all the time. Are we going to believe him or not? Well, say, preacher, what about me? I don't have that happening to me. Well, maybe his heart's not full of guile. <laughs> maybe he's got a big empty spot in there where only the Lord can feel, and he's got it reserved for him, and he can receive from God that glory and that joy. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Well, I believe him. Well, you're around him enough. 
you'll see that he's got a, his, his spirit, his attitude. Have you ever noticed? Have you ever heard a preacher preach a good message with a bad spirit? Have you ever heard a preacher preach a, just a kind of a simple sorry message with a good spirit? Which one got a hold of the people? The good spirit. The spirit did. The spirit's everything. It's everything. So why is it everything? Because it's the life. The life doesn't originate in the soul. It sure doesn't originate in the flesh. It's the spirit. That's the life. That's your life. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless my brothers and sisters tonight. Thank you for this little time we had together. I pray for them now. I pray for every one of them that you bless them, go with them. Pray for these requests we've had tonight. The sick folk, those that have lost loved ones, those that are facing surgery, those that are going through a hard time right now, Lord. Our Heavenly Father, I pray for them. And Father, I know this. I know you've got intercessors in this church. I know you have. And may have intercessors out there who are not part of this local assembly, but they come, they watch us, and, they, and they're with us as we go through our services. I thank you for them tonight. I thank you for all the George Muellers, for all of them, every last one of them. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the George Muellers. Amen. Sheila and Scott are going to sing for us.